So thank you, Bonnie, for inviting me to speak tonight. I'm truly honored to talk to this group. I will share with you that I feel a bit like the elephant on the stage in this cartoon. Elephant's invited to, to give a piano recital, and he says, what am I doing here? I, I play the flute. <laughs> the reason why I feel a bit like that is that um, most of the introduction you just heard was about neuroscience. And so that's my career, it is really a study of brain and memory. But I'm not going to talk about the brain and memory, I'm talking about a completely different area, which is cardiovascular disease, nutrition, cholesterol, and health. And so it's clearly something very new to me. And so you might wonder, what motivates me to take on a second, completely different area? Well, what motivated me basically was my own personal health. And I'll share with you a bit about my health and my concerns going back 15 years. As you can see here, this red bar shows that 15 years ago, my combination of triglycerides and cholesterol put me at greater than 15 times the rate of likelihood of developing a heart attack compared to a person with ideal biomarkers. And I took this very seriously. I was very concerned that I was at a high rate and for developing a heart attack. So I'm faced with a problem. I get these numbers. I'm faced with the same problem we all are. What is it that I should eat? Are eggs safe to eat or should we avoid them like the plague? <laughs> the question we ask all the time. So I was very concerned. Should I eat eggs? If I eat eggs, will it raise my cholesterol? Will that increase the likelihood I'll have a heart attack? What really concerned me, though, is at some point after my levels stayed high and I was on a low-fat diet, and the only thing that happened with that was that I gained more weight. And now I was about 20 pounds overweight and 20 pounds heavier than I am now. And so my doctor sat me down and he said, it's time. You really need to go on a statin. Your cholesterol numbers are not good. Um, you've done your best, just as the commercial here says. And so again, I took it very seriously, but I guess I like to think that instead of going to the pharmacy, I went to the library. So I decided at this point, I needed to learn all I could about cardiovascular disease and nutrition so I could actually treat myself, or at the very least understand that maybe it was necessary for me to take the medication. So I've devoted the past 10 years to learning about heart disease and nutrition, and I'm going to share with you what I've learned here tonight. So this is what we're bombarded with. We see fear of saturated fats. Saturated fats will raise your cholesterol, and in theory then cause you to have a heart attack. So you want to eat lots of foods that then will lower your blood cholesterol. So you see off this obsession here, we're, we're covered with uh, uh, advertisements that emphasize that we need to lower our cholesterol and not eat saturated fat. And of course, what we have are drugs that reduce the cholesterol, those are the statins, and so we want to take drugs such as Lipitor or Crestor to lower our cholesterol and therefore reduce the risk that we'll have a heart attack. So the two topics that I'll cover tonight are the issue is to limit consumption of cholesterol and saturated fat and also to have serum cholesterol levels as low as possible. And what I'm going to try to convince you of in the next 45 minutes is that this is entirely wrong. <laughs> I have a... <laughs> So I will have to, unfortunately, I'm going to cover this very briefly. I'm going to cover a few thousand studies in the next 45 minutes. But we'll see if I can give it a go and get it done in time. So we'll have a little history here. The very first person who actually was obese and did something about it, lost weight, and then, in fact, wrote the first diet book, was this fellow named William Banting, who lived in London, middle of the 19th century. So Banting was overweight. He had typical obesity kind of problems. He was over 200 pounds, 5 foot 5 his doctor actually prescribed that he limit and completely eliminate carbohydrates. So he eliminated potatoes, bread, and sugar, but he was allowed to eat as much meat and other animal products as he wanted. It was a success. He lost quite a bit of weight. He got down to a good level and lived into his 80s, which isn't bad for mid-19th century London. And the reason why we know about this is he actually wrote a book describing what he ate and his weight loss called The Letter on Corpulence. He sold 10,000 copies in London. It's a very famous book, basically describing the importance of reducing carbohydrates in his diet, which was effective. You then have in the U.S., doctors are noticing that people are becoming obese, becoming prevalent. And one doctor who was treating people who were overweight decided to write a book, How Nature Cures. And right on the cover of the book, you can see here it says, a statement of the principal arguments against the use of bread, cereals, pulses, which are beans, potatoes, and other starch foods. And he's emphasizing that an obese person can be given a diet of meat, and if you exclude the bread and potatoes, they will lose weight. Once they start eating the bread and potatoes again, 
their weight will increase. So specifically, you're seeing in the 19th century, doctors are noticing the association of consumption of foods high in carbohydrates and obesity. Now, there's a massive amount of literature that I can't cover for the first half of the 20th century, but I think what's very useful is that we have a leader of the field in the 1950s. His name was Alfred Pennington. Ran a clinic to help people who were obese, at risk for heart disease, published in all major medical journals. And here you'll see from one of the papers what he recommended that obese people should eat. One half pound or more of fresh meat with the fat. In fact, he emphasizes the meat does not have enough fat. You should buy fat specifically and add it to your food. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny now, but this was medical science in the 1950s. And what is it that he said you need to eliminate? Once again, for almost a century, no bread, flour, or sugar. Okay? So you see consistently the emphasis on reducing carbohydrates in the diet. For someone who is obese, they lose the weight. And so when we get to 1972, I think it's important to understand that with Atkins' book that came out, it followed over a century of research, emphasizing that it's the carbohydrates that increase weight and the reduction in carbohydrates in the diet helps obese people to lose weight. And in fact, if you compare the two, they're remarkably similar. The Atkins diet was not a fad diet. Frankly, it wasn't revolutionary. The idea had actually begun in 1863 with William Banting's book, so it's over a century in which doctors have been showing that by reducing carbohydrates in the diet, you can lose weight. And so the, the rub on the Atkins diet, of course, is you lose weight, but you're still going to have a heart attack. You just leave a thinner corpse. <laughs> and so is it healthy? And again, I could go over dozens of studies, but we don't have the time. Um, and so I'm going to cover one study which is very useful for us because it has people with high cholesterol and low cholesterol, people with diabetes as well as not with diabetes. And so it shows the actual diet, what it is that they ate. And we also have biomarkers, which can tell you whether or not the Atkins diet puts people in peril. And so here we have what's a very low carbohydrate diet, also called a ketogenic diet. And this is what you can eat on a ketogenic diet. Basically anything that is protein and fat. So any animal food you, hear, you see here on the left side, fish, meat, poultry, and especially full-fat cheese. Okay? There are no non-fat foods on the left side. And basically any vegetable that isn't potato or corn. So it isn't anything that will raise your blood sugar. And these people would have five tablespoons of oil per day as a part of their diet. And in this case, it's olive oil, but it could be butter. It doesn't really matter. And what is it that they could not eat? Basically the same thing you see from Banting. It's high carbohydrate foods. So you eliminate foods that raise blood sugar. No fruit juice, no soft drinks with sugar. And so you look at the results, and basically this is now 150 years, confirming weight loss. This is in kilograms, so in pounds, you're looking at these people are over about 200 pounds. And so this is over the course of a year, whether they have high cholesterol or normal cholesterol, their body weight dropped dramatically. And so the diet works. Now the question about biomarkers. Well, here you have all the basic biomarkers. And rather than go into great detail, each one goes in the right direction. There is no drug that can produce a change in the biomarkers like a low-carbohydrate diet. If you look here on the opposite end, this is the HDL right here. The HDL is called the good cholesterol because when it is higher, you're less likely to have a heart attack. And so it is only the low-carbohydrate diet that you'll actually find an increase in the HDL. What you have here on the right are triglycerides, which are fat in the, in the blood, and the fats in the blood decline when you reduce carbohydrate consumption. And over here on the far right, on the bottom, that is blood glucose, fasting blood glucose, drops dramatically just by reducing carbohydrates in the diet. So every biomarker moves in the right direction with the low-carbohydrate diet. And again, just to summarize, a vast amount of research what we have here just published this year the work of over two dozen scholars in the field of nutrition. Published in the journal Nutrition, basically they're emphasizing carbohydrate restriction is the best approach for someone, whether they have type 2 diabetes, they also apply it to heart disease and obesity in general. And here you see summarized on the bottom the benefits of carbohydrate restriction in diabetes. This applies to other diseases as well. 
are immediate and well documented. There are no justifiable concerns about reduction of carbohydrates in the diet. So with all that science I've just shown you, I just gave you basically a summary of 150 years of research coming to a very clear conclusion. It's carbohydrates that are the demon on your plate. It's the carbohydrates that are making you fat. That is what you need to be aware of. And so now you go to the store and you're looking to lose weight. And what is it dietitians, nutritionists, and the American Heart Association will recommend that you eat? Fat-free cheese, fat-free yogurt, fat-free butter, and cholesterol-free eggs. And if you look in the middle, you've got cookies. Isn't that fantastic? They're fat-free. <laughs> so it almost makes it look like a health food, right? It's just pure sugar. And what does the American Heart Association recommend? Basically low-fat food, lean meat, low-fat dairy products, skim milk. Why is it the recommendations are completely out of touch with the science? Well, here I think is the origin of why we've been given such misinformation. The low-fat food mania, I would say, began in 1955 when President Eisenhower had a heart attack. And you see along with this graph as well, an increased incidence of heart attacks in Americans over the course of the first 50 years of the 20th century. So there was great concern at the increased incidence of heart attacks occurring. And here with Eisenhower having a heart attack, it just made it so much more personal. Now, the fact that Eisenhower was a chain smoker <laughs> didn't seem to become realized to people. No one said, well, gee, the guy's a chain. He actually was diagnosed with heart disease before he became president. And Americans had become smokers. There was a dramatic increase in smoking, which, of course, now we know is associated with heart disease as well as lung cancer. But no one was talking about him being a smoker as contributing to his heart attack. What we had was a man who came forward, and he worked with Eisenhower's doctor. And he went on national television, supported by the American Heart Association, and he said what's killing Eisenhower, causing him to have a heart attack, is the sausage he's eating with breakfast. <laughs> and so it's this man named Ansel Keys said it is fat in the diet, particularly animal fat in the diet that causes people to have a heart attack because it raises your cholesterol. And this is now you can see is in the news. Who was Ansel Keys? Very important to understand who this man was. He had no education at all in heart disease or nutrition. He had a bachelor's degree in economics and a PhD in oceanography. <laughs> Ansel Keys had languished in obscurity for decades. He studied fish physiology. He conducted one study, basically I consider unethical, in which he starved conscientious objectors of World War II. But this is basically the extent of Ansel Keys' experience with nutrition and cardiology, which is nothing. What was his actual experience? Well, while he was on sabbatical, after World War II, he visited Italy. And he saw thin Italians, and he was told that they didn't have heart attacks. So he decided that it was because they weren't eating much meat, they didn't have much saturated fat, that is why they weren't having heart attacks. And it was Ansel Keys who came up with the idea for the Mediterranean diet based basically on Italians living in post-World War II in which there was a depression. Basically, you couldn't really afford to eat fat animals at the time. So he also pointed out one of his papers to support his idea that it's fat in the diet that causes people to have heart attacks. So this is a paper published in 1953. Think about this contrast to where Pennington is publishing in the New England Journal of Medicine. Keyes is publishing in barely better than a, a newsletter out of a hospital. But he published this paper, which shows a relation between fat in the diet and people dying of heart attacks. And so what you can see here is that the more fat in the diet, going along here, you have more deaths from heart disease. So in the US, you have the most fat in the diet, and you have the most heart attacks. And so this clearly is evidence, as he said, that it's fat in the diet that causes people to have heart attacks. The problem with this graph is it is a result of him cheating. Okay. This is not real. Ansel Keys actually had data from 22 different countries. He chose six data points to create this graph. This is not a secret that I just discovered. I have to reveal that to you. Okay. This was known at the time that he had cheated. In fact, here is a paper published in 1957 
basically saying that Keyes had cheated. They introduced the paper quite politely by saying, no information is given by Keyes as to why he chose six out of 22 data points. So we're going to show you all 22 data points. So they actually start off by showing his graph, and then they show their graph of all the data points. Now here are all the data points. And it's important to understand these are data that came right out of World War II. And so you have post-war Japan and Italy, in which basically you have very thin people. You do have a low rate of heart disease, um, but you really don't have much fat, which people could be eating at the time, too. So it's a bit artificial. But anyway, if you look at the overall curve, which I've surrounded 20 of the 22 data points with the rectangle, you can see a random scatter. That when you have all the data points, there is no relation between fat in the diet and heart disease. And in fact, that's exactly what the authors concluded. The suggested association between death rates from heart disease and fat in the diet cannot be accepted as valid. So it's very clear that Ansel Keys doesn't know what he's talking about as far as diet. He doesn't know anything about heart disease. And he lied when he published that paper in 1953. So what is the result? He gets to be on the cover of Time magazine. <laughs> Ansel Keys became the leader of nutrition and cardiovascular research in America in the 1950s and into the 1970s. He was a member of the board of directors of the American Heart Association. He basically controlled, to a great extent, funding in heart disease in the US. He served on the editorial board on cardiovascular journals, yet he knew nothing about heart disease. He was seen as the expert in America on heart disease and diet. And what did he say in that paper in 1961? Americans eat too much fat, too much saturated fat. That's the kind of fat you get from animals. It raises cholesterol, damages your arteries, and leads to coronary disease. The only way, sure way to control cholesterol is to reduce the fat in your diet to 15% of total calories. And you've got to cut saturated fat to 4%. It's really important to point out, he made up these numbers. There were no studies that supported this idea at all. He didn't propose this as his idea. He proposed this as fact. Now, it, to me, this would just be sort of a footnote to history to show that Ansel Keys' ignorance followed by good science means we no longer follow it. But what happened was he was such a dominant figure in the American Heart Association that you see in their current recommendations. You go to the American Heart Association website, it still follows Keys' original recommendations that if you eat saturated fat, you'll raise your cholesterol, you'll increase the likelihood you'll have a, a heart attack. The American Heart Association currently recommends that you have only 5 to 6% of your calories from saturated fat. They continue to recommend that people have margarine rather than butter. The same thing Keyes said in 1961 without any justification. And the remarkable thing is, if we actually look at the data of what were people consuming in the 20th century and up until the 1950s, specifically looking at butter and margarine, what you find here on the blue line is in the 20th century, consumption of butter was stable up until World War II, in which it declined dramatically. Margarine, on the other hand, is increasing in consumption with World War II, and this is when you're finding increase in heart disease. So if anything, it's the margarine that people are consuming in conjunction with smoking that explains why there's an increase in heart disease in the U.S. in the first half of the 20th century. Now, let's see what Keyes recommended. Basically, we, all, we should all eat like starving Italians. Okay? <laughs> That's the Mediterranean diet. Um, very low fat, 15% of the calories from fat, 4% from saturated fat, based on what he saw in Italy. Well, let's actually look at the data. Okay, this is published in 2012 British Journal of Nutrition. And here you are seeing individual countries, all the countries of Europe, and plotted basically on the, the amount of fat they consume, and specifically this is saturated fat. The amount of saturated fat they consume versus the rate of death from heart disease. And what you actually find here is more fat in the diet is associated with less deaths from heart disease, the complete opposite of the graph that Keyes created in 1953. Let's look at the data point that's at the very extreme, right here. The people who eat the most fat and have the least heart disease. France, okay? The French are truly horrible people. <laughs> they don't respect the American Heart Association at all. 
They have an absolutely anti-American Heart Association diet, and Keyes refused to acknowledge that the country even existed. <laughs> In France, they have over about 40% of their calories are from fat, and over 15% of the calories from saturated fat. And I like the quote here, T.H. Huxley, who said, basically, it's a tragedy of science when you can slay a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. <laughs> the ugly fact is the French. And what do we call that ugly fact? That ugly fact, let's move the data over, and that ugly fact is called the French paradox. You know, as scientists, we develop hypotheses. And hypotheses are supposed to enable us then to do tests. And when the hypotheses fail, we change the hypothesis. But only in the field of nutrition and all the history of science, when you have data that are opposite, that don't support the hypothesis, you dismiss them and you call it a paradox. Paradox is always used in nutrition when the findings are not consistent with what the American Heart Association and Ansel Keys said. What you got with the French is they don't have olive oil, they don't eat olive oil, they eat butter. And they eat pate, a diet heavy on liver, and saturated fat. And look at this, it's so horrible. This woman here, this is what the French people all look like. <laughs> well, all right, they don't all look like her. <laughs> But the French paradox, of course, is these people eat so much fat as a percentage of their calories and yet they have a very low rate of heart disease. Not only that, they're annoyingly thin. <laughs> Here you see countries <laughs> around the world, and you've got the Americans up here, the fattest people in the world, eating lots of low-fat food, and here are the French down here, less than 10% of them are obese. If you go to France and you see an obese person, it's probably an American on vacation. <laughs> so it gets worse. Now we have politicians telling us what to eat. George McGovern, 1977, got a committee together to tell people what kind of food they should eat. And so George McGovern, against actually recommendations by experts at the time, because he was on a low-fat diet, He decided Americans should all be on a low-fat diet. So his committee came up with a book, Dietary Goals for the United States. They basically said it's saturated fat that is causing people to become fat and to have heart disease. It was McGovern's goals for the United States that then led to the food pyramid. It's produced, by the way, by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And so if you look at the base of this pyramid, six to 11 servings of bread and cereal, and other grains per day. Okay. And so this is what was guiding Americans in the 1970s and the 1980s. And so what happened? Well, people started eating fat-free food, and what we also had was high-fructose corn syrup developed at this time. And the great thing about high-fructose corn syrup is you keep going back and get refill after refill, and it doesn't cost you anything. Super cheap sugar led to increased consumption of carbohydrates beginning around 1980, and whereas the fat and the protein are relatively stable. And the result of increasing consumption of carbohydrates and overall more calories is that people got fat. Americans got fat as a result of the demonization of fat. And so you see we now have increasing obesity that basically began at the time when people are now increasing consumption of carbohydrates, people got fat. Now, the good thing is um, science ultimately prevails. Good science prevails. And so what we've had actually in the last five years are people coming out and basically saying, um, you do not need to fear fat in your food. You need to fear the carbohydrates. Restrict the carbohydrates. Here is a recent editorial in the Journal of the American Medical Association emphasizing the limit on fat presents an obstacle to sensible change. It actually promoted consumption of harmful, low-fat foods. What we need to target are the carbohydrates, what this is showing. And there are now numerous studies coming out emphasizing that the guidance has been wrong. And in fact, time kind of chronicles this. We began with Ansel Keys and the misinformation in the 1950s, and now we have the cover of Time saying, eat butter, it's safe to eat again. Okay? 
So the uh, fat has been exonerated. It's now really the carbohydrates. Anything that raises blood sugar rapidly ultimately causes harm. And that is a summary of the first part, okay? That what we need to do is target carbohydrate consumption, reduce carbohydrates. The science has been bad, okay? And it's been promoted ultimately by the low-fat food industry and the American Heart Association. Next section. Now let's talk about cholesterol. Okay, cholesterol phobia. Everybody's afraid of cholesterol in their blood. Clearly, cholesterol must be toxic. For whatever reason, the liver makes this cholesterol, and it has one goal and one goal only, and that is to block your arteries. <laughs> and so here you see cholesterol, which is like some sludge in your arteries. You've got to lower your cholesterol. Here is your heart is afraid of the cholesterol. And of course, we now have almost half of all Americans aged 60 years and older that are taking some kind of medication to reduce their cholesterol. So let's talk about why it is that we fear cholesterol. Well, if we look at the origin, it actually began in the first half of the 20th century. And perhaps the, the primary science was that you have people who have what's called disease, which is hypercholesterolemia, which you have very high cholesterol, when, and you also have cholesterol in your arteries. And so when you find a blockage in the artery, you find cholesterol within that blockage. So therefore, cholesterol in the blood seeps into the arteries, causes a blockage, and therefore causes a heart attack. And you do see an association of people who have high cholesterol and they have more heart attacks. That's reported in this paper. So it's really very simple then. Is the association of cholesterol with heart disease, is it a causal influence? So I have up here, do police cause crime? Wherever you see crime, you also see police. So it's very simple, police must be causing the crime. You want to eliminate crime, just eliminate the police. Well, the same kind of logic applies to cholesterol. So if cholesterol actually causes heart disease, then people with high cholesterol should die from heart disease at a relatively young age. That's rather straightforward. And if cholesterol is actually causing heart disease, then lowering cholesterol should be very consistently found to reduce the incidence of heart attacks. Two very straightforward predictions. So let's look at that. Well, here is the first major study, and still the largest study ever, on people with extremely high cholesterol. Over 1,000 people studied over a long period of time, 1966, journal medicine. And what does it say? We found no evidence that high cholesterol shortens the life of people, either men or women. And in fact, it's clearly compatible with survival into the seventh and eighth decades. So one of the most important studies ever published that actually followed people over a long period of time says that having high cholesterol does not kill you at a young age, does not cause you to die of a heart attack. There's another study in which people with extremely high cholesterol, well over 300, so they're diagnosed with hypercholesterolemia. These are people 60 to 74 years of age. Cholesterol, total cholesterol is about 330. And so we have here, it's in the danger zone. The American Heart Association recommends you actually be below 200. So you're 60 years of age, you're now followed for 10 years to see who will die of a heart attack, who will die of any cause. That's how this study is conducted. You follow them for 10 years and look at their rate of death from a variety of different causes. So we have here on 100, 100% is, 100% is the rate of death in the general population. That <laughs> means everybody's dying. <laughs> Eventually everybody dies, but what this is actually saying is the rate of death over that 10-year period. And so if the rate of death of this group of people is greater than the general population, then they will be greater than 100%. They'll be dying at a greater rate than the general population. But if they're dying at a lower rate than the general population, then their rate will be less than 100. We look at the rate of death of people whose cholesterol is 330, and what we find is a 31% reduced rate of death if you are 60 years of age and your cholesterol is 330 and you go to your doctor and you say, if I don't lower my cholesterol, what's the likelihood that I will die in the next 10 years compared to someone who lowers his cholesterol? Well, the doctor's saying, forget about it. Don't even think about it. You need to get your cholesterol down. But the answer is right here. You have a 31% reduced rate of death if your cholesterol is screamingly high. If you are 60 to 74 years of age. And this did not escape the notice of the authors. They made it very clear. Men and women over 60 with super high levels of cholesterol did not have an increased rate of death, either from heart disease or any other cause. 
A striking finding was the reduced rate of death from heart disease with advanced age. And I don't have time to go over the dozens of other studies that are very consistent with this finding, that you will live longer, you will be healthier if you have high cholesterol and you're over the age of 60 than if you have low cholesterol. Uh, just to show you, it's not just one anomalous study, and I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> Another study, follow people for 20 years. Um, very famous Honolulu Heart Program. Follow people for 20 years and look co at their cholesterol levels compared to mortality. And what you find is increased mortality in older people who had low cholesterol. They died at a much higher rate than the people who had high cholesterol. And I like their interpretation. We have been unable to explain our results. <laughs> That's about as candid as scientists will get. And they go on further to say these data cast doubt on the justification for lowering your cholesterol levels. And another thing about low cholesterol levels is you are less healthy if you have low cholesterol and you're over the age of 60. Low cholesterol has been repeatedly been shown to be associated with a significantly higher rate of cancer. And here is just one of the studies showing increased risk of cancer, and in this study, hemorrhagic stroke and heart failure. You are less healthy if your cholesterol is low than if it is high. Now, if not cholesterol, then why is it some people with high cholesterol do have heart attacks? Well, here's a very important study that helps us to understand what actually causes heart disease. So here again, we have another study. So this is in the pre-statin era, in which people with extremely high cholesterol were not treated. They were studied in these experiments, and at that time, it wouldn't have been considered unethical. Now, if your cholesterol is over 300, you have to be on a statin. It will be considered unethical. But in this study, we look at these people who have very high cholesterol. Total cholesterol is over 300, and we actually can look at the different components as well. The LDL, which is called the bad cholesterol, is equivalent in these two groups, HDL and triglycerides. They're all equivalent. This two groups, the same levels of cholesterol, but the one in red has heart disease. The one in blue does not have heart disease. So what's the difference between the two groups? The difference is clotting factors. The people who have more clotting factors are the ones that had more heart disease. Those are the ones diagnosed with heart disease. So what you have here is FB is fibrinogen, and uh, factor eight is another clotting factor. So these people can have high cholesterol, but what matters is how much in the way they have in their clotting factors. That is, do their platelets get sticky and then block their arteries? So the clotting factors are crucial. And in fact, if you look at clotting factors, independent of age, you find a very consistent relation between fibrinogen, which is the major clotting factor, and death from heart disease as well as stroke. So here you have fibrinogen levels of people of a broad range of age for stroke as well as heart disease. In either case, what you find is a strong association of clotting factors with death from cardiovascular disease. This is independent of the cholesterol levels. So ultimately then what we're looking at is activated platelets. Every risk factor for heart disease comes down <laughs> to the common factor of activated platelets. And so whether it is smoking, smoking causes coagulation, high blood sugar, sugar increases co uh, coagulation, um, metabolic syndrome in which a person is overweight, high blood, check, high blood sugar activates platelets, and stress activates platelets. So you're looking at a common factor which is the activation of platelets. It causes them to get sticky. You end up having clots moving around your blood vessels, which ultimately then causes damage. So why is it, after all I've just told you about, that people want to have their cholesterol as low as possible? It actually began with this critical study in 1984. For decades, studies had been going on lowering people's cholesterol, and they all were failures. This was the first study that would propel the industry then to emphasize to people that they had to lower their cholesterol. This is published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. In this study, over $100 million was spent to find almost a half a million people. 480,000 men had their blood tested. They took the men who had the highest cholesterol in the top 5%, averaging 290. Those are the ones that were included in this study. This study would show, ultimately, 
that if you take the people with the highest cholesterol, lower the cholesterol with the drug, you would save lives. And so the hypothesis was then the risk of dying of a heart attack would be reduced by lowering their cholesterol. So they targeted the men basically who are on their deathbed with having such high cholesterol. They lowered the cholesterol with a rather primitive drug called cholestyramine, but it very effectively does lower uh, blood cholesterol, or they're given placebo and then followed for about seven and a half years. This was the groundbreaking study. The group that had lower cholesterol had a 24% reduction in death from cardiovascular disease, coronary heart disease. This was the turning point in cholesterol history. There was one problem with the study. There's always one problem with these studies. But the problem with the study was, and I've copied this directly from the paper, the risk of death was actually not reduced in the cholestyramine group. Well, that doesn't make sense. You lowered their cholesterol, you've reduced death from heart disease by 24%, but overall these people are not living longer. Why is that? Well, let's actually look at the data. So I've taken this directly from the paper, and I've graphed this in terms of there not being a negative outcome, like death is a negative outcome. So, <laughs> so you, you live instead of dying. So that's your survival. How many people didn't die? And you're looking at of 100%, Almost all people basically survived, and there is no difference between the groups. That is why there's no difference in mortality. How many people did not die of a heart attack? That's out here, coronary heart disease, death. Almost nobody died of a heart attack. So what you see all along here is, this is an incredibly and disturbingly healthy group. So there are very few adverse events at the end of the seven and a half years. So where is that 24% reduction in heart disease death? It's right there. That difference is a 24% difference between the group, and it is statistically significant. How can that be, you say? Well, this is how you do it. The actual data are 98.4% of the people given the drug did not die of a heart attack, and 98.0% of the people given the placebo did not die of a heart attack. The actual difference is 0.4%. Eight men, you start with half a million, you take the top 5%, 1,900 in each group, give one the drug, the other doesn't, and you end up with a difference of eight men. So how do you turn 0.4% into 24%? Well, it's really quite simple. <laughs> it's called relative risk reduction. It's basically a way of using statistics to cheat, to greatly amplify a very small effect. So you take the difference between the groups, which is 0.4%, and you divide it by the rate of heart attacks in one of the groups. So you got a ratio into a ratio. And you can then turn that 0.4% into 24%. Yeah, I responded the same way when I first saw that. That's not right. Okay, so that's your 24% right there. This was basically a $150 million study that failed miserably. What they should have said was, we've been barking up the wrong molecular tree. It's not cholesterol, really, that we should be following. Instead, they declare victory. The directors of the study declared victory. This is a turning point in cholesterol heart disease research. They said that it's the cholesterol in the food that the men were eating, which has had nothing to do with a diet study. It was a drug study. On Time magazine, you're saying, you see, bad news with cholesterol. And they said, now what we need to do is develop drugs to be able to lower cholesterol in people because people didn't like taking the cholestyramine. This is the turning point that forms the basis of why they developed the statins. It was this drug that overall had no real effect on heart disease. So now we move into the statin era. And I don't have time to cover all the statin uh, studies, although I, you'd probably be amenable. We could spend the next couple of hours here talking about statins. But I'm going to show you one of the best findings ever and one of the most highly prescribed drugs is Libitor. And this is a finding that's been promoted very heavily, so I'm going to show you the best finding with a statin, and that is this 36% reduction in heart attacks with Libitor. And so let's look at that study. And here again, I want to confirm for you, this is how this is presented to physicians in the world. A 36% reduction in fatal heart attacks and non-fatal heart attacks. So what did the data actually look like in the study? 
remarkably similar to the cholestyramine study. <laughs> this is actually what the data look like. And you see those asterisks? Those are statistically significant differences between the groups. And here what we have is on the left, this is the 36%, the absence of fatal and non-fatal heart attacks. Right there, that is a 36% reduction as a result of drug treatment. Where is the 36%? It's right there at the beginning. Now, how do they do that? So again, you start with the real data. 98.1% of the people on Lipitor did not die of a heart attack. 97% of the people on placebo did not have a heart attack or die. So this study is very straightforward. If your cholesterol is high and you go to the doctor and you say, I think I'll just take a placebo, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and you can tell the doctor, I have a 97% chance of not having a heart attack if I take that pretty good drug called the placebo. But the way you calculate the 36% is to take that difference, which is 1.1%. And how do you take the 1.1% and turn it into 36%? It's the same game that was played in 1984. But let's look closely at this ad. It's right there. The 1.1% is actually in that ad in blue font on a blue background. And it says that right here, the difference is 3% death in the sugar pill, 2% in those taking Libitor. Clearly, the lawyers must have gotten that little blue font in there because they had to show you all the data. So you've got 36% and you've got 1% in the same ad from the same data. So how do they do that? Well, you take the 1.1%, that's the difference between the groups, and you divide it by 3%. That's the rate in the placebo. That amplifies the 1.1% and turns it into 36% then you are legally allowed to put in the ad that you've reduced heart attacks by 36%. But the actual effect, as you can see, is right there. That is a 36% reduction in heart attacks with Libitor. That is what the wonder drug does. It actually changes the rate of heart attacks by 1% compared to placebo. So it's also important to realize 1% means that you have to have 100 people who are given Lipitor to have one less heart attack in one of those 100 people in three years. So when you take that Lipitor, you know, it's a line from the movie, do you feel lucky? Okay. <laughs> are you the one person that will have one less heart attack in three years? That's what this study really showed. And so how about if the ad actually has the real data? And it says Lipitor reduces the risk by 1%. Would you be as interested in taking the Lipitor? I think not. Uh, the second study I will cover, because the latest drug is Crestor. A woman is so excited, she's so down with Crestor, because she's now not going to have a heart attack. And when the work came out on Crestor, it emphasized here, cut heart attacks and strokes by 50%. And in fact, the uh, author in the study, John Castelline, said it's spectacular. It actually prevents a heart attack, the Crestor. Spectacular effects. So let's actually look at it. But first, understand with all these spectacular effects, Crestor is now one of the highest prescribed drugs in the world. It's potentially going to overtake Lipitor. So $7.6 billion in sales from this spectacular study, which is called the Jupiter study. So let's actually look at what physicians see when they go to a conference. This is the effect that they see from the Jupiter study, a 44% reduction in coronary events. It does look spectacular. Now, it is actually important to realize that it's a little more complicated than this. The study was actually stopped here at two years. Very few people are actually out here at the end. But it's even more important than that. Let's actually look at the scale when the study is terminated. So that 44% is actually right here before two years because they considered it unethical to continue the study because so many people were being saved by Crestor. We look at the scale. You kind of know what's coming. I'm going to be criticizing the study. Um, the scale actually goes from zero to one, okay? So the scale is important. Let's actually look at the real rate of adverse events in this study. This is a graph, and I'm not making this stuff up. This is a graph I've copied directly from the paper, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. 
This actually shows the rate of events in the two groups. Right inside here, if you get out an electron microscope, you can, <laughs> you can see the difference. This is the effect of Crestor. This is the rate of actual events of heart attacks, of deaths from heart attacks on its, the actual scale. Because if everybody died of a heart attack, it would be way up here, and Crestor could have brought it way down. So the actual difference is trivial. And yet you've got a 44% reduction. Right inside here is a 44% effect. And again, how do you do that? I'm going to actually show you the data. This shows what happens okay, when you don't take the drug versus taking it with a good outcome. Again, meaning survival. So this is the, the effect right here. Again, you've gotten used to seeing this now. You've got the Crestor versus placebo with that microscopic effect right inside there. The difference is 1.2% between the groups treated versus no treatment. 1.2, and here you have 2.8%. 1.2 divided by 2.8 is 44%. That is how you create a huge effect out of nothing. A huge mountain out of a rather small ant molehill. All right. Now, you can still get 1% benefit, so that's better than nothing, right? And if there were no adverse effects, you might say, well, it's not a bad drug to take, but now let's talk about the adverse effects of statins. This was the first study, actually, that reported that the people who took the Crestor had more diabetes, developed type 2 diabetes. And it's interesting that when they presented it, they call it small. It's small but significant. Well, why didn't they call the other effects small? Why didn't they call the reduction of heart attacks small? And so it is a significant effect, which frankly is small. Here, more people taking the Crestor had developed diabetes. But it's important to note, they were not looking for diabetes. The diabetes happened to be reported by the physicians they, to the agency. So this was an incidental finding that the people taking the statins had more diabetes. When you actually look for diabetes, which means you test people's blood sugar at the beginning of the study, and they take the statins then for six years, then you find a dramatic increase in the incidence of diabetes. Here is a six-year study showing that people given the placebo, about 6% of those develop diabetes, but almost 12% of the people taking the statins develop diabetes. So these are healthy people taking the statins, and you now have almost doubling the rate of type 2 diabetes developing as a result of taking the statins. You also find in these statin studies are typically stopped at about two to three years. That's relatively early if you want us to be able to see cancer develop. We already know that low cholesterol is associated with a higher rate of cancer. This is a very rare study in which you actually follow people for 10 years to look at adverse effects. And what is very clear in this study of women, which you find compare with no use of statins to those who use statins for over 10 years, more than double the rate of breast cancer and those women who use statins for 10 years. And there's a clear association, whether it is actually caused by the statin itself or low cholesterol. The association is there of dramatically more cancer in people who have low cholesterol. And finally, there are numerous other adverse side effects of statins that I won't take time to go into each one, but it's very clear that it affects brain functioning, reduces memory capacity, very clear evidence of erectile dysfunction, rhabdomyolysis, renal failure, hemorrhagic stroke, and liver dysfunction. All to get that 1% better than a placebo effect for heart disease. And so sometimes people have said, well, I can talk about this in a group, especially not to uh, physicians. But I'll, first I'll tell you, I have been lecturing to cardiologists. I've lectured at cardiology conferences. I've also lectured at diabetes conferences, and I've just recently published what I've just shown you in a medical journal, a peer-reviewed medical journal, Expert Reviews in Clinical Pharmacology, in which I've described, along with my colleague, Ufi Ravenskov, we have described the deception that has gone on in the cholesterol and specifically the statin research over the last several decades, and we wrote that the war on cholesterol has been fought by advocates that have used statistical deception. The reality is that there are trivial benefits that are offset by their adverse effects. This paper came out only a few months ago and has already been cited now by a couple of editorials. One in Open Heart, in which they have cited our work 
emphasizing that there is an exaggerated belief in the modest effects of the pharmacotherapy. And they wrote that these exaggerated effects now mislead patients and doctors. Another editorial just came out this week, citing our paper, emphasizing that it is clear that the cholesterol heart hypothesis is a fallacy of modern medicine, basically saying that ultimately we will see that using statins to lower blood cholesterol is equivalent to bloodletting, taking out a vital substance from the body with drugs. So I'll finish by saying that I have benefited by the vast amount of work of my colleagues, of MDs and PhDs, and here is just a subset of the work that's out there, outstanding scholarly books written by MDs and PhDs. Uh, you have three examples here at the bottom, and a colleague of mine, Dr. Paul Roche, wrote that the belief that heart disease is due from high cholesterol from saturated fat has been perpetuated by powerful forces using tactics to preserve the profits and reputations of those who promoted this doctrine. That is, came from Ansel Keys, comment on his dogma, which never really was a hypothesis. He further says the advent of statins has fueled this fallacious lipid hypothesis. The reporting of side effects has been suppressed, and the benefits, alleged benefits, have been hyped. I thank you for your time. Would anyone care to comment, provide any accolades, compliments? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Very, very informative. But I have to ask a question on your low, car low carb. Uh, is fruit included? The uh, question is, is fruit included? Um, yes. The good thing about fruit, especially in moderation, is that the water and the fiber that would be in fruit would slow the increase in blood sugar. But you should realize that if you have a 16-ounce smoothie filled with orange juice and fruit, that is going to increase your blood sugar. But clearly having an apple or a small amount of fruit is, is not a problem at all. How about right here? This might be a little off the subject, but I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, many of the cardiologists prescribed uh, 81 milligrams of aspirin per day. And lately, there have been some uh, television programs on this that perhaps it's bad for you. I've just wondered if you've uh, looked into that at all and whether it is or is not. Uh... Yeah, this is where deception reaches its highest level um, in the recommendation that people have a baby aspirin. You call it a baby aspirin, it sounds like it's so harmless. Uh, Bayer has been petitioning the FDA for the past 15 years to be permitted to say in advertisements that if you take an aspirin, it will uh, reduce the chance you'll have a heart attack, your first heart attack. And so they very carefully make their television commercials appear as if when you get that note that says your heart attack will happen today, if you had taken a, ba a baby aspirin, you would not have a heart attack, and that is not the case at all. So the adverse effects of taking a baby aspirin are bleeding, a hemorrhagic stroke, um, as well as ulcers. So first of all, a healthy person should not be taking a baby aspirin. There is evidence that actually after a heart attack, or at the time of the heart attack and soon after, that an aspirin can help, primarily because it's reducing clotting. But basically, there isn't good evidence that a person should be on baby aspirin for a long period of time. Yes. Oh. I'm sure not the only one who noticed the serious lack of bacon on the buffet tonight, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> um, I kind of have two questions. Um, one is, I understand... Um, the bias with the pharmaceutical companies, but what would be the motivation for the um, Heart Association or for doctors to perpetuate the myth? And secondly, um, I understand sugar is a problem, but um, is there a way to treat the high platelet issue? So you covered um, motivation of the American Heart Association, which um, perhaps the fact that they're very heavily sponsored by the margarine industry is, is a factor. Um, they've been heavily sponsored by the liquid oil, corn oil industry for decades. Um, but perhaps, you know, we can leave that to speculation as to why. Uh, I don't think doctors actually are involved in this. Doctors are being educated by people in authority who are being paid very well by the drug companies. <clears throat> Was there another? Oh, yeah. As I said, you have control over platelet aggregation. It is smoking, 
being overweight, <clears throat> um, uh, stress. So these are all factors that cause your platelets to become sticky. So these are factors that are also under your control. Since you work with memory also, with everybody trying to get lower cholesterol and supposedly having lower cholesterol numbers, is this being factored in since the brain is fat and needs all that oh. fat to the increase that yeah. we're having so dramatically? Thanks. So your question is really about cholesterol and brain function. Um, the brain is about 25% cholesterol and absolutely needs cholesterol to be able to produce new brain cells and new connections. And there's a very clear connection, not only with low cholesterol to cancer, you see a connection of low cholesterol to poor cognitive functioning. And so the extensive evidence that you find of statins reducing cognitive function is consistent with the idea that basically if you starve the brain of cholesterol, it just doesn't function very well. Yeah, I was curious. You, you, there's so many things that affect everything, so it's hard to pinpoint one. But one thing I've read about is that taking cholesterol, reducing statins, reduces an older person's already reduced production of coenzyme Q10, and that that is a vital heart energy. You know, so are you hurting your heart by taking them? Yeah, absolutely. And there is evidence, actually. So you, you raise a very important point. Um, part of the metabolic pathway in which statins interfere with the production of substrates is that you not only block cholesterol, but you block CoQ10. And CoQ10 is absolutely necessary for good energy production, for good health, for basically for the mitochondria to function properly. And so, yes, you absolutely, there's evidence that you're damaging your muscle. You're damaging your heart muscle by reducing the CoQ10. And the industry's response to that would be, well, then take CoQ10 supplements which actually have not been shown to reverse the, uh, the damage to the, to the muscles. We have time for one more question. In the, in the back. You alluded to, in the beginning, the um, cholesterol and the plaque and the hardening of the arteries. Uh, is there a relationship with, uh, in terms of high or low cholesterol or high or low fats as to whether a person will get uh, plaque buildup in the arteries? Uh, thank you. That's a great question. The remarkable thing is that the more fat you eat, and in fact, the more high-fat cheese that you eat, the less calcium will build up in your arteries, the less your arteries will be stiff, the less damage there will be to your arteries. It's a remarkable finding, actually. And what's really important is that along with the high-fat cheese and other high-fat foods, you actually have vitamin K2, which helps to direct the calcium into the bones. And if cal you don't have enough K2 from animal products, then the calcium just drifts into the arteries, and that contributes to hardening of the arteries. The arteries get damaged, and then the cholesterol is actually used to repair the damage. It's also used by the immune system to attack bacteria and viruses that are causing the damage. So the cholesterol really is analogous to what the police are doing at the scene of the crime. Let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Yeah.